thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Thanks, uh, the Vice Principal, Professor Bata. Thanks, uh, Prof. Nguruwe. Uh, thanks to everyone who is listening in. Um, as you can see, my presentation is titled Indigenous Knowledge Across the Curriculum, an Epistemic Shift and Cognitive Shifting Event. Uh, the thrust, of course, is on what we should do with indigenous knowledge, how it can enhance our higher education curriculum, and how it can empower us as a people. Um, it's, it's good, possibly, that this is coming at a time after we have been celebrating our Culture Month and Heritage Month, but then it is also coming at a time when the general global uh, backdrop is one that is characterized by hypocrisy and uh, lip service to the diversity of cultures and of heritages. We know when we look at the whole thing that knowledge generation and dissemination, of course, is that of the formerly colonized is at the periphery and it's actually not accepted or acknowledged as knowledge. Uh, we are always informed that we need to have our knowledge uh, affirmed and um, verified by the Western systems of education of science. This is the challenge that we face. So we then ask if our knowledge is put at the periphery, if the world talks so much about globalization and it does not embrace our own knowledges, we ask then why do we have to bother to celebrate the diversity of women cultures as is enshrined in the 2005 Convention on the Diversity of Cultures. And yet the same world fails to embrace the world's knowledges. It's quite ironic then that while we celebrate plurality, we do not celebrate the plurality of different uh, epistemologies that characterize our, um, our world. There's therefore need for an, an epistemic and cognitive or thought shift where indigenous knowledge uh, is to be made part of the academic diet so that both instructors and learners can benefit as well as host institutions and host nations so that people get a lot out of uh, what has been bequeathed to them by their own ancestors. But the problem then is we are dealing with a persistent colonial agenda things have never really changed for the better. What has happened is, despite uh, the attainment of independence, uh, what has remained part of our academic diet is that uh, we have continued to label ourselves educated, but measured on the basis of what the Westerners have given to us or what the Westerners uh, insist we should um, embrace as the real knowledge. But then we need to understand uh, that we are caught in a web where colonialism, like I said earlier on, has persisted. And of course, we have to accept the reality that we have two types of colonialism, where we have a benevolent type of colonialism and one that is virulent or that is quite malevolent. And when you talk about the Netherlands colonialism, you're talking about white on white colonialism as was experienced in Britain when she was under Rome. When you talk about the other version that is very virulent, uh, this is very clear. We look at Africa and how she has been exploited. Africa has been occupied by Europe. She has been dispossessed of her resources, even of her own people. Examples, of course, that people come to mind are Leopold's Congo, uh, where close to Rothschild between 12 and 20 million people were killed and of course unfortunately history records only the genocide that took place uh, in, in in Germany during the second world war and of course closer home with Namibia where possibly what is according to by the first genocide of the 20th century for some that was the trail run of uh, the genocide that was later to take place at places like Auschwitz and Buchen Wild uh, in, in German. Uh, why is it that we faced this uh, genocide? We are looking at a situation where blacks, especially in Africa, were considered as uh, non humans or as subhumans at best, and we had to be Christianized. Of course, for us to be Christianized and to become human, we had to be subjected to Western or European uh, forms of knowledge. 
and the fact that we are looked down upon not only as people but even our knowledge is even uh, realized in the case of the united states where the way uh, black bodies are policed uh, leaves so much to be desired to be black in the united states is to uh, move around of course with the threat of death uh, coming on you at any time so what we need to really appreciate and understand is that colonialism didn't end with the attainment of political independence in fact it has continued to shape and give direction to the lives of the formerly colonized I'm, I'm using a language that is not mine we are talking through languages that are not ours and we believe we are very competent in those languages fair and fine but then we become a, a caricature of ourselves because we don't believe we are not rooted in who we are so we need to understand that from a decolonial perspective while physical colonialism has ended we have a more virulent type of colonialism that is still persisting and this has led of course to the death of most indigenous communities where we have died not necessarily physically or sp but spiritually and culturally and this is a form of genocide that has been labeled uh, identified by mehag uh, because of intellectual relocations and dislocations and in some cases uh, intellectual losses because we have lost so much in terms of what we have in terms of indigenous knowledges and we have been told by um, our forms of education and through religious platforms that to follow our own ways of life is a form of heathenism and we will become sure uh, fuels of the fires of hell so we have tended to abandon what is ours so when we talk about identity we are talking about pre-planned and intentionally executed ways where people lose all their spaces their symbols their ideas and values and some of these values are carried in our indigenous knowledges and of course we have lost our cultural property both tangible and intangible I think we are all aware of how much we've lost to the Western museums and they are refusing to return some of that material. So the whole idea is when we continue to follow Western education and the way it has been packaged is that it is meant to make us blind to the realities of our own situation. It has been meant to make us blind to the value that is in our knowledges. And today to engage and talk to fellow blacks on the importance of indigenous knowledge is really an uphill task because most people think we are busy chasing the wind so this has been the impact that we've had from um, the colonial agenda's persistence and of course <clears throat> what has resulted is an epistemic side where our knowledges have died and we have been forced to accept and embrace western knowledge as the only knowledge so what we really need to do is we need to shift from um, Western knowledge, what we are referring to as an epistemic and cognitive shift. And of course, we need to develop our own epistemologies where we have to raise them to the same level that is equal to that of the West. And of course, we are not saying we have to abandon that of the West. Already we are some type of hybrid people the best way forward would be for us to pick the very best that comes out of the west and the best uh, that comes from our own uh, indigenous knowledges and of course we need to understand we are already accustomed to this maybe but we need to possibly rewrite what indigenous knowledge is and of course we are looking at bodies of thought and practices that are cherished by local communities and when you talk about local communities we are talking about those who are by geography and the history found in a given geographical area and when you talk about the geographical area in this case in the context of Africa Africa is a broad geographical area anyone who has come from outside Africa then does not qualify to be indigenous now we need to understand indigenous knowledge as both theory and as practice now when you talk of indigenous knowledge as theory we are saying it functions as a general principle or board of principles that explain epistemologies of the global south then we also need to look at it as a system of beliefs whose owners have come to accept it as a means that guides them on how they relate and engage with and within their environment and that environment includes the relations with fellow human beings as well as 
other flora and fauna. In this case, we are now looking at it as something that is practical, as practice. And when we talk about indigenous knowledge as practice, we are saying it can be used as an idea or belief or method as opposed to theories relating to it. Now, when you talk about the practical nature of indigenous knowledge, we are talking about the way indigenous communities engage with the environment in a manner that benefits both sides. They utilize it, they practice it in different fields, in areas like agriculture, the use of intercropping and all that. That is the practical nature of indigenous knowledge. Now, it also gives guidelines or procedures on how certain activities are to be carried out. Now, if we are to look at it as practice and extend it to academia, we can see it, its applications being um, applied. I mean, it's it, it, we can see it being applied to curriculum design and how this curriculum is to be implemented. And this may also inform uh, teaching methods as well as uh, research. Indigenous knowledge can come can become handy in all those areas. And of course, we also realize that the adoption and use of indigenous knowledge in curriculum design and it's being enriched is only possible if there is a deliberate cognitive shifting on the part of the curriculum planners and designers. The key here is cognitive shifting. Are we prepared to migrate from the current forms of knowledge, the current way of thinking that we have to another one that we think is important? This brings us to the next slide, which focuses on cognitive shifting. Now, <clears throat> when we talk about cognitive shifting, we are talking about a psychological and intellectual process where people deliberately redirect their concentration from one fixation and obsession to a different one that people embrace and accept as of greater value. We have to have that psychological willingness, that intellectual willingness to say this is greater, this is a higher achievement. And if we consider it that, then cognitive shifting is possible. So we are talking about a form of cognitive flexibility that is a response to curriculum issue. When we talk about thought shifting or cognitive shifting, we are talking of a mind shift. I think the term mind shift, mind change, those are common things. We know it's, it's difficult in a world where we have been so much uh, deep in, in a world where our knowledge has been thrown to the wall, it has been trampled upon, but there has to come a time um, when we realize we have to move on and embrace what is ours. Now, this is not just talking from nowhere. If you have to look at cases like Japan, like China, the so-called Asian tigers, they've gone into their cultures, they've gone into their practice and embellished these with Western forms of knowledge. It is only us in Africa who have stuck on to that which is Western. Those ones have mixed, they've picked the best and they've even brought their religion to develop a work ethic. Now, for us, I think South Africa, Zimbabwe, we are currently uh, dealing with problems of uh, COVID corruption, even in Namibia. All this is a result of us wanting to be like those with money. Uh, it's because there has been no cognitive shifting. There has been nothing since we attained the majority rule. What we have just wanted to be was to be like the white man. And we've consumed his or a curriculum and they pass it on down to our children, grandchildren. And the result is we find ourselves in the murky waters that we are in today. So the only way forward is cognitive shifting. And of course, this is only possible if we choose to decolonize our education curriculum, especially the higher education curriculum. Now, the next slide takes us to the need for an epistemic shift. And when you look at our epistemic shift, we realize um, that our higher education curriculum is one of the spaces where engagement with colonialism has to take place. It is us who are said to be scholars, but scholars in whose view 
uh, through whose measurement, uh, to what end? Those are questions we need to understand. But then the engagement with uh, colonialism is only possible if there is an epistemic shift or disobedience, as you cannot. Uh, of Gachen is also uh, made reference to that, and he has written strongly against uh, the persistence of um, colonialism. When we look at uh, the idea of an epistemic shift, we are looking at ideas that emanate from the likes of Annie Barokishan, and of course, who talks of the colonial matrix of power and the contestation of unilater unilateral knowledge production that uh, knowledge doesn't have to be only produced by one side as uh, Santiago Castro Gomez also pointed out. So, as I've already indicated earlier on, we are still within the grip of colonial hegemony and this is of course entrenched by the Western educational models that have placed the knowledge of the West as the only knowledge and of course uh, this has led to us losing what we have, which we our language in Shona, we say Kurasa Chirimuapangekuombera, throwing away that which is in your armpit because you want to clap your hands, and then you throw away something that is greater of greater value. The next uh, slide again is still on a epistemic shift, which takes us to what Minolo in 2009 talked about when he talked about the non neutrality of Western education, but is something that is tainted by geopolitical configurations uh, where people are racially ranked and of course the racial ranking uh, is led to people being labeled this one is more knowledgeable this one is less knowledgeable i uh, realize even if you want to go to europe or north america or australia you need again to undergo some english tests when they say you've already passed the same english so they are constantly shifting goals in other words, we are the disliked ones. We have people coming to our own shows even when they don't even know a single word of our languages. Now, again, what we are realizing is Minolo, of course, is speaking to the need for an ep epistemic shift. And this idea, of course, and the value of delinking from the Western colonial matrix of power is further amplified by Noda, who observes that Western intellectual colonization plays a deciding role in the development of the discipline, which is reflected not only on what is considered proper knowledge, but what is also published. This is the tragedy that we find ourselves in. So the knowledge that we think we are producing is measured against that of the West. And if you are to look at our journals, even in Africa, we have journals that are under Taylor and Francis. Who is Taylor and Francis? What is it that they are getting out of us? What is it that they are dictating to us? Whose standards are we following? These are the questions we need to under, to ask, and these are the reasons why we say there is need for an epistemic shift. The West is always on a perpetual gatekeeping process where they are promoting and entrenching their own forms of epistemology. So what we realize is Western intellectual colonization decide what is acceptable and what is not acceptable. Uh, that is the next slide. We realize they decide what is acceptable and what is not acceptable, and of course, this is the same world that is at the forefront of championing uh, people to everyone to embrace globalization and at the same time the same world uh, <clears throat> insists on us uh, only following a certain way of doing things and that we're supposed to be a global area where everyone comes on board western epistemologists of course we realize they've not been friendly to us, the formerly colonized, and as indicated, we need to shift. And the next epistemology, of course, um, talks about the suspect nature of uh, Western epistemologies. And this, of course, the suspicion in our part of the country is confirmed by, uh, affirmed by this proverb. Uh, loosely translated to mean that which has come from another part uh, is to be handled with care and in a way so to speak in, has to be sanitized because it may be detrimental to your well-being um, so when we talk about then 
the need for an epistemic shift. Uh, we look at what Minolo also refers to epistemic disobedience. And of course, epistemic disobedience is part of the delinking process as a way of contesting the colonial matrix of power. Of course, the question is, can we successfully do that? But we need to understand that epistemic disobedience then becomes a more militant version of the epistemic shift. And it queries why Western knowledge forms that are grounded in Judeo-Christian heritage should be accepted and brought to us and Pedro is the only forms of knowledge that matter and the only ones uh, that can help humanity to develop and prosper. The question is, why is it that those are the only forms of knowledges? And yet when you look at the world around us, we talk about Mapungubwe, the, this has been Heritage Month. Who built that monument? We have Great Zimbabwe. And in fact, the, the, the Zimbabwe tradition, the, the stone structures tradition, is in South Africa, is in Mozambique, is in Botswana. All those Zimbabwe's are found everywhere in, within almost all of Southern Africa. Was there any Western system that taught us that? Or it was people, it was internally generated, it was indigenous ways of doing things, of construction. But now today, you hardly come across a structure that is fashioned uh, along the same lines as the Great Zimbabwe Monuments or Mapungubo or everything. So we've already uh, come to believe that if a structure is Gothic, then I think we've clenched it. That is the danger. So we need to shift. Then the next slide is on indigenous, the indigenizing the higher education curriculum. Now, the tragedy with us in Africa and other formerly colonized, especially those who had to go to war uh, to attain a majority rule, is that when uh, the guns of the liberation war fell silent, we celebrated uh, victories, which in reality were only pirate victories. They were empty victories because what we won was a political seat, uh, not um we, we we didn't win um the actual power because the actual power is in the way people are formed and fashioned and socialized and they are formed and fashioned through education that was never the all that we fought and now we realize we've lost it so we need an education that is based on ubuntu but because we have followed uh, the Western system of education, we are effectively phantoms. We are the walking dead. We are dealing with an education that is cannibalistic, that is based on Western capitalism, and it does not promote the well-being of communities or of society. It promotes individualism, which is what has made us to get where we are today. The next slide is still again titled Indigenizing the Higher Education Curriculum. And we are saying what we need is to indigenize our higher education curriculum, but are we willing to do that? What we need is a deliberate and a deliberate epistemic and cognitive shift on the part of planners, on the part of implementers. But more importantly, there is also need for a political will. Are our politicians willing? to see change, but we need to go beyond that. We also need to engage other key stakeholders because stakeholders, especially educationists, uh, possible employers, all these need to be made to be part of the process. Otherwise, they may feel left out and they may feel like they are outsiders. So we need a curriculum that is owned by everyone else. When you look at African universities as well as those in the South, uh, we realize that we have to develop a curricula, a curricula that places value on the subjugated and marginalized knowledge. Uh, we need knowledge not only for the culture that produced it, but also for people from different cultures. So we should value indigenous knowledge in such a way that it is all embracing, we, 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 which, is, which is quite interesting because while we have 
been so much immersed in Western forms of knowledge. The same Westerners come to us and tell us that when in Rome, do as the Romans do. And then when they came to Africa, they never did what the Africans were doing. So it's quite ironic. So what we need to do is then we have to learn from what we lost to global capitalism, to Western epistemologies, because some of them have taken our knowledge and repackaged it. We need to uh, include, more importantly, indigenous knowledge into our current university curriculum. In the next slides, I discuss examples of what is it that we can get from indigenous knowledge and into which elements of the higher education curriculum. Those are only examples. I think from your own uh, universities and from your own communities, you can find uh, where you can bring in indigenous knowledge. Um, <clears throat> here I'm having an example of um, a subject called supply chain management, which is offered in our university, uh, which is, of course, basically speaking to logistics. According to Pedsai and Chere, the indigenous knowledge is a lot of significance for uh, supply chain management. They argue that it is important for drivers as well as even uh, company managers to be aware of indigenous ways of weather forecasting uh, that are informed by the flora and fauna of the areas of operation because this will minimize chances of, for instance, uh, getting stuck on slipper and mud roads in some of the areas they would have gone to make this. This is a real problem, especially in this country where um, a very few uh, roads are attached. We only have sort of intercity roads and those that go to tourist resorts, those are the ones that are largely tied. So this is important. And of course, the argument they make is also it also saves a lot on financial resources because no one would have to travel to go to those areas if people are pre-warned, pre-armed, and of course, well uh, educated in the area. We are still on indigenous in the higher education curriculum. And of course, uh, we also need to understand uh, the raw business setup. From an Ubuntu perspective, we value relationships. Uh, in our case in Zimbabwe, we value totems very much. Uh, I think for those who were online earlier on, you had uh, Prof Ngulube speaking to me in Shona. Uh, Prof Ngulube and myself are brothers because we share the same totem. So what it means then is, if my son is to come to South Africa, he already has a family there, he already has a father there, Prof Ngulubo will take care of him. Now, what are the implications of such relationships when it comes to the supply chain management that I've earlier on talked about? Now, the same totems uh, give space for people to place others. Are they daughters? Are they sons? Are they nephews? Are they even sons-in-law? And because of those relationships, when I have my rural business, I don't necessarily have to always pay money to go and collect goods. When my adopted new son-in-law is a lorry that passes by, you would always pass by through my shop, uh, get possibly crates for drinks, and I'll give you money for the orders. He goes, he buys, he brings them back for the father-in-law. Of course, I may give him a little for a drink and all that stuff, but this is how some indigenous rural businesses have survived on the basis of those relationships. We are, we are not saying we always have to use them. There are times when they've been exploited for the wrong reasons, but like in any situation, even race has been exploited for the wrong reasons. But I'm saying they can be positively harnessed. And this is what we have. It was a way of creating cohesive communities. We can still help ride on the back of uh, such practices to build successful rural businesses and of course, sustainable rural communities. Um, I move to the next slide. And we are saying, of course, through such relationships, costs are minimized and in some cases eliminated. Uh, of course, we note when it comes to such issues that curriculum planners need to also look at the issues of not people just using money, but at times um, labor supply and also butter for goods. This is how we rural communities and rural economies at times uh, uh, function. 
Now, in the area of agriculture, of course, we can use indigenous knowledge in the area of uh, crop and animal production. Of course, we can use indigenous knowledge again, as the research tool has already earlier alluded to. Then, of course, uh, local ecology and cultural systems and uh, belief systems are important. I give you an example of uh, preventing stream bank cultivation through the conservation of uh, conversion of stream banks into burial grounds for stillborn children. In, in, in my part of the country, we when stillborn children are buried, they are not buried in the other graves. It's only on the stream banks. But the actual effect is that no one then would want to go and put a field in a burial ground. But the reality is stillborn children are not a common occurrence. So there's very little burial taking place. But already that ground has been um, eco-spiritualized. It has been turned into a spiritual space and as a result, um, no one wants to cultivate that. Now, if you come with laws that say don't cultivate, people can break laws. But if you come and create a barrier through physical activities like burying people there, like burying stillborn children, people avoid that area. Now, we also ask questions. What is the value of Zundera Mambo? Can it be sustained? Can it be modified? When you talk about Zundera Mambo, we're talking of a communal field that is presided over by the local chief or the sub, uh, the, the local headman. And what should we do in terms of in ensuring food security for the local communities? Can it not be used? Um, and again, we come to issues like seed identification and the maintenance of seed banks. What is the value of those practices? What skills can we impart to the students that we are teaching? We are looking at a situation where we have hybrid seeds, some of them that just collapse under the weight of uh, weather changes, or some of them that cannot reproduce seed for the next season, and then people become captive to the jaws of um, Western capitalism. Let's talk of Monsanto. We all know those those cases. So these questions, of course, are, are, are significant, not just to agriculture, but even to those in social work and those who do development studies. And of course, in the area of food science, we talk of the conversion of um, leftovers like sadza, which is pap, into my hair. I think you call it my hair on that side uh, to minimize loss. But today, because we, we at times we lack that knowledge, we just throw things away. What else can we look for from indigenous knowledge that can develop green skills? that can contribute to a less polluted and dead environment. Like, how do we deal with offcuts of cloth in the clothing industry? How are they taken care of? How do we handle waste? These are questions we need to ask when you are doing health environment or environmental engineering. I think all these things are important to bring on board because you are using what people already know, what some people have already been exposed to. When you look at these things, then we, we get somewhere it will help and what is it that we can do with indigenous knowledge in the face of the fourth industrial revolution is it just about documentation and all that stuff we talk so much about the disruptive technologies is not indigenous knowledge itself not part of that uh, disruptive system because it's already disrupting uh when we talk about the need to indigenize the higher education curriculum are we not disrupting the way things have been and of course, we need to also understand the management of conflicts from an indigenous way. I think Rwanda would give a very good example of the Gachacha. How have they managed it? How can we incorporate for those peace and development studies or peace studies? How do we incorporate mechanisms that are indigenous and homegrown uh, into our curriculum? Even when it comes to intellectual property rights and all that stuff, we need to ask you questions. How do we manage the commons? How do we manage our rivers, our forests, and all those things? Because while the Western system says one can own a forest and a river and everything else, is this proper? Can we privatize common and public goods? Then, of course, <clears throat> when you talk about those who are studying uh, development studies, uh, what is the value of indigenous knowledge? For those in the legal system, how do we bring, what aspects of the indigenous laws can we bring into the system? I would like to thank you, ladies and gentlemen, in Otenda, Sikom.